Everybody got their haircuts yesterday. And you will take that fiber, you're gonna have it processed by a cooperative? Now we'll, that... we'll send it over to local mill. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll send it over to mill over to Blue Ridge, oh. and they'll take care of it. Wow, okay. And they'll turn it into roving and the yarn, and the roving is the process before it's spun in the yarn. Right. So a lot of people in the area will buy the roving to spin their own yarn, or they'll use it as felt products. So they may want to felt a scarf, they may want to felt a vest, a hat. So mm -hmm. they'll use it in a different way than just yarn. So, but that's what comes off our alpacas. You have multiple paddocks here that you're rotating the alpacas? We do, we have 10 acres open ground, which we have the paddocks in, and it's broken up into 10 different fields. So we have three here, and then we have seven fields on this side. And the dogs move with the alpacas. The dogs will communicate from field to field. So generally the boys are up in a high field, with the boys up in a high field, just as Enzo barked back there, he's letting the other dogs know that he sees something up on the, up at the street level. Which came first in your case? Was it the alpacas or the, the livestock guardian dogs? Basically it came about the same time. The livestock guardian dogs came because of having the alpacas. We knew when we had the alpacas, we had to have some type of guard animal, whether it be a llama, a donkey, or a guardian dog. So from that, we started looking at different livestock guardian dogs. So once I read and understood the Maramas, we were hooked. And for the last six and a half years, we have lived with three full-time Maramas on the farm. This dog breed goes back a long ways. This breed goes back around 2,000 years from the Abruzzi Mountains of Italy. They were used by shepherds to guard against wolves, bears, and people stealing the sheep. Can you have one livestock guardian dog? You can have one, but if you have a pack of coyotes come in, from everything you read about coyotes, coyotes will work the dog. They'll work it from two angles. So it's always better to have two dogs. This way the dogs aren't overtaken if a pack was to come in. We never had a problem, never had a problem at all on this farm. And uh, we attributed 100% to the Maramas. We have a large wood line that goes back up in the, the, up in the mountains. We know that the coyotes come through there. There's trail cameras set up there. We know the packs come through, but they do not come on their property. And the alpacas are young, they're only 18 pounds. So if an eagle was gonna come down, they're gonna pick an alpaca out of the field as well. I was more worried for the puppies, being the puppies are there, there's a tree there, or just even, even a hawk flying around, hmm. um, especially when the pups are real young. They look gentle right now. They turn into a different dog when something's there that doesn't belong there. They turn into a dog that's, this is mine, you're not gonna hurt whatever's here. And that's what they're bred for. I mean, they're bred to make sure that they can be as gentle as this and yet do their job well. The idea isn't to come out here every day and fight a coyote dead out in the field. That's not the purpose of having a livestock go in dog. It is to be a deterrent so that other animals aren't encroaching under the field. Just to keep that threat outside the perimeter. Yes. You rarely see them actually doing anything against a predator. And if they're doing their job extremely well, that's exactly what you want. You don't want to see the predators, they're gone, they're doing something else because the dogs have been a deterrent. There's one story where this person was, you know, praising their dog for killing a coyote in the barn. And it's like, well, what was the coyote doing in the barn? You know, I mean, I want this stopped way before the coyote gets in the barn. Um, and usually, with a wild predator, usually it's the deterrent effect that's going to do it. Now, if there's neighborhood dogs and they're in there, then you're gonna have a fight and you want your dog to win that fight. If you're out west and you have wolves and you have uh, grizzly bears and you have mountain lions, you may want two, three, four dogs. And, and where they have wolves in Europe, they have those wonderful spiked collars and out west, they're starting to use spiked collars mm -hmm. and that protects the dog if the dog gets into a fight with a wolf or with a bear or whatever. What are some of the most common predators in Virginia? Your neighbor's dogs are probably the worst threat. And then coyotes, depending on where you are. But that's pretty much now throughout the entire state. In this area, bears are more and more common. And bears are causing more and more problems. And uh, bobcats, foxes, uh, usually those are limited to you know 
smaller animals, you know, newborn kids, newborn lambs, things like that. And then some avian predators, uh, eagles. Uh, in this area, probably bald eagles would be more common, golden eagles on occasion. And it, that's usually the individual bird and not all of them. Um, but that's true of all the predators. It's the individuals, not the whole class of What about vult vultures? I, I hear stories of different mm -hmm. types of vultures and um, uh, with cattle and sheep. Mm -hmm. The black vultures uh, can indeed be predator predatory, and they will actually sail out, and especially during calving, they will actually attack the calves during calving. If you were talking with a Virginia livestock producer who, say, has a flock of 50 head of lambs, and all of a sudden they get a predator problem, and they call you and say, I need a livestock guardian dog, what do I do? What do you do? Well, a lot of people wait until that Pro, till they have a problem before they seek help. And that's not the time to seek the help. Not saying that you don't want to seek the help at that point, but when you have animals, it's part of the care of the animals, is to protect the animals. And you cannot be with your animals that are out in the fields 24 seven. But you can have some type of live guy, livestock guardian protector, whether it be a dog, a llama, a donkey, you can have some type of animal that will be with it. We decided to go with the dogs. We felt the dogs were a better fit for us. They may not be for everybody, but they were a better fit for us. We use dogs and we're happy with dogs. One reason we use dogs is we have a significant rabies threat here in, in raccoons and foxes. But I mean, with, with the raccoons especially, the dogs will take out the raccoons which suits me just fine, because they stand between me and my goats and rabies. We have Karakachan dogs, and they're an old Bulgarian breed, and they were um, always used by the people that took the sheep and goats from the lowlands up into the mountains in the summertime and then back. Tell me the story of, of how you initiated this importation of this breed. I work with breed conservation, and then I made contacts with the Bulgarians, and they were working with their native dog breed, and that, that became endangered during the communist times. And so we basically imported some Karakachans. We were very pleased with what we got. We got dogs that would stay put reasonably well and not make a whole lot of noise. And this, dog, this breed comes in different colors, and that just helps me. I can tell one dog from another at a glance. We have a lot of visitors, uh, especially students and other things, so there's people in and out. We wanted, we wanted the dogs to be completely safe around people. Breed purity can be taken to an extreme, but it's useful because that makes the dogs predictable and you want predictability. Now, um, so that's, that's a reason for breeds. That's a reason for keeping these breeds pure. Some people will cross the dogs. Um, when you crossbreed these dogs, you, always, you need to make sure that it's a cross between livestock guardian dog breeds. Their brains are different than other dogs. They're non-predatory. If you cross outside that group, not only do you get the predatory behaviors back, they may actually be stronger than in a generic dog. And so if you cross these dogs with herding dogs, so if a, if a farm has a guard dog and a herding dog, and they're not controlling reproduction and you get a crossbred litter, those can actually grow up to be dangerous dogs. Tell mm -hmm. me about the difference between the herding and the guardian dogs. They're basically polar opposites almost. Herding dogs, move the animals from one place to another. And so that works because they're actually sending predatory signals. So if you watch a sheepdog working, the sheep are responding to that dog as if it's a predator. And it's a controlled predator, you know, it's controlled. You don't want them to actually connect. And if we were talking, if we were in South Texas and we were talking about cattle dogs, it's a more aggressive dog because you need that for the range cattle. But um, those dogs work by virtue of being controlled predators. Um, the livestock guard dogs, in contrast, especially the really, really good ones, are completely non-predatory. And you can actually watch this as the dogs interact with the sheep or the goats. They can walk, if they're walking calmly, they're just going to walk right through that flock and the flock won't even move aside. They're, they're, they completely ignore that dog because that dog is not sending any predatory signal at all. What specific traits in the breed are you looking for as a Virginia farmer? I'm looking for something that's, when I'm not here, that that dog is gonna make sure that my alpacas are safe and that we feel comfortable when we're off the farm, whether it be overnight or whether it be on vacation, we know our farm's safe.
I notice you stuck your hand through the fence, but if I stick my hand through the fence. Yeah, just hold on to you for a bit. Is, is that the reason you have the, the sign? Yes, we have a sign. <laughs> we have a sign because no matter, they see the white dogs. Everybody wants to pet the, the pretty white dogs. So the tail's wagging like it is right now. And there's a misconception that that tail means, oh, come and pet me. And, and, and it doesn't. Is there a concern about maybe an overly aggressive guardian dog uh, that, 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 that may attack someone? Under Virginia law, you, you, you accept certain responsibilities by going onto a farm. As far as the Maramas, we know they're not going to come over the fence. So we had no worries about the dogs pursuing the people outside the fence lines. If someone was to go into the fence lines, it would be a whole different story and they would be doing that on their own, um, at their own risk. Now, do they, in, in the night, would they just bark proactively, so to speak, just? No, not at all. Not at all? Not at all. If they're barking, they either smell something, hear something, or see uh -huh. something. It amazes me how smart these animals are, these dogs. These, uh, they, they know when a certain animal presents a threat to their flock, but they're not threatened by necessarily a squirrel or a groundhog. Right. Usually they will accept their own, you know, their own household dogs, okay, and their own household cats, okay. But things that walk on may, may, may be actually not accepted. You don't train them like that. No. That's just in their breeding. It, it, right, and they know they know what's a threat and what's not a threat. Um, one winter we were having kids, so I had to go out and it was getting cold. So I actually went out and did two o'clock in the morning checks, and there was a possum in the middle of the pasture. And I thought, well, this is kind of interesting, you know. So then, because there's dogs, you'd think this wouldn't exist, you know. So next night there's the possum. Next night, there's the possum, and there's Tupelo five feet away guarding the possum. So that had become his pet possum, <laughs> <laughs> and he was he was guarding the possum. Now, you know, if I had if I had possum predation predation on my chickens, then you know, I would have taken offense to this, but it was okay. Yeah. You know, and then the possum went out and got a life, and the dog still had his life, and everything was fine. But you know, that sort of thing. So the possum wasn't a threat because he was in with the goats, and so the dog didn't bother, you know, doing anything about it. Does it have issues with wandering this breed of dog or does it stay right by the flock? They never try to escape. They could, if they really wanted to dig, they have humongous paws and claws and they could dig their way out in a heartbeat. They never once in all the years that we had them tried to, to get out of the, out of the um, fence area. Mm -hmm. They primarily accept that the fence area is their territory, whether it be there's 10 acres or it be 100 acres. They know their, their territory. Now, whatever animals are in there, they accept as their flock as well, whether it be cows or sheep or alpacas. They get to know that that's their animals that they're supposed to be around. We see a, um, a trend with pastured poultry. Would they be appropriate in that setting? They would 100%. This breed can learn to protect just about anything. They've been used to protect little penguins on an island in Waterbury, Australia. They were actually getting overrun by fox that were coming to the island and killing them. So they had started a project called the Penguin Project with Maramas on the island and found by putting Maramas on the island, they were able to save the colony of penguins that were nesting there. And that project still runs to this day. There is a process, again, you just can't take a Marama, whether it be a pup, six month old or one year old, and think that you're gonna take that Marama and just throw them in the, in the uh, chicken coop. That's not gonna happen and it probably wouldn't happen with any dog. When you have a dog that's 100 pounds and you have a three pound chicken, they don't usually pair up too well together until there's a proper introduction. Socialization is the key. So basically you want them exposed to the species that they're supposed to protect because they basically accept that as their group. So you want them exposed to livestock, you want them exposed to people, and you want to, you know, if you're going to leash train them, you want that done. They're not going to become obedient superstars because that's just not in their head. Um, but these are not pets. They're not pets. Well, but I mean, they're not even wired to be pets. Yeah. Um, but you know, basic things like sit, um, that allows me to 
in a subtle way assert my dominance. And then when I have a 100, 100 pound dog at the end of this, or a 120 pound dog in some cases, you know, I can tell him to sit, I'm in charge. Then that helps because I don't have to, I don't want to have a fight with a 120 pound dog. I want to have a fight with a 10 pound puppy. They mature slowly, so even up to two years of age, you want to make sure that they're not playing too rough with the livestock. They may not be predatory, they may not be aggressive, but if they're just wanting to play, they're big dogs, they can play too rough. Is this a point where a good, trained, older dog can be a major asset in training a younger dog? Yes, absolutely. And of course, the problem is that those dogs are so valuable to the owners that they're not for sale. You know, it's rare that you're gonna find a dog like that. Sometimes when people sell out of agriculture, they will have a dog that needs to be rehomed. You know, and, and in which case you can find a really, really good dog. But usually you have to grow your own. Dogs have to be raised around livestock from day one. That is their world. Yes. So this barn was already here when you, when you bought the place. Yes, this barn was here. Um, we made an office out of the first area and then we made a vet room out of the second area. And then we used the others for storage. We used first for feed, tool room. We call it a her room. And usually this is open, oh, but now that boy. we have the pups, pup pups, these pups are seven weeks old. Seven weeks. Yep, and they, they range on average about 20 pounds. How important is it they accept people, but also the flock that they're guarding? You want them to look up to you as the alpha. Um, you don't want them to be controlling you. You don't want to be fearful of a dog that you're out there going to pen with. You want to make sure you're able to feed the dog and stick your hand down there while it's eating. When someone does take one of these pretty babies home, they need to keep them with their, their flock, no matter what it is, whether it's birds or sheep or cows. They need to keep them with the animals 100%. Ideally, and, would they take home a pair or a single? Ideally, it would be to have a male and a female because there's going to be an alpha out of the same sex and somebody's going to want to be boss. As any puppy, they, they want to play. So when they have a sibling there, they'll tend to take that playness out on their sibling. People go, well, why are they jumping after the, the sheep? Why are they going after the goat? Well, because they're trying to take that puppy energy out. Um, with the alpacas, we'd probably get them in there about four months full grown and we could probably leave them by themselves. That's going to vary. Um, four months doesn't mean they're going to be guarding they're going to be learning it at that point they're going to be out in the field so they're going to have to be you're still going to have to keep an eye on them um and to make sure that the animals are bonding to them just like they're bonding to the animals um people that keep them with fowl it's going to take a little longer so it's a, a very slow process it does work you have to be patient understand that they're like kids in mentality okay. so how many times you tell your your kid not to do something, <laughs> you still, lose still does something. <laughs> so you have to do the same thing with the dogs. Um, you can't get dis discouraged because you told them one time not to chase the chicken. Are there any misperceptions by the public about these animals and what they do, the, the lifestyle that these animals live? I mean, they're outdoors 24 seven, aren't they? By and large, and one, one of the misconceptions is people will start complaining to the Humane Society that this dog is out. Now, in my case, and in most cases, they have access to shelter. You know, they're welcome to go in, they're welcome to stay out, whatever they want. And, you know, sometimes when it snows, you know, I'll come out and find a new snowdrift, and then I poke the snowdrift and I post this dog, you know, <laughs> just perfectly happy. You know, and I mean, that's up to him. That's, that's his choice. So, yes, they're out, and basically they're never bored. They're not inside. You know, they, they can do what they want. They choose their own activities. You know, so when you think about it, I mean, if I were a dog, this is the kind of dog I'd want to be. The process of acquiring your first livestock guardian, where do you start? Wherever you are in your area, try to find people that are using different solutions, you know, and see how they like that solution. What's working, what's not working. You know, what they think the strengths are, what they think the weaknesses are. There's going to be strengths and weaknesses in any system. You know, so, you know, the weakness here, they eat dog food, they don't eat hay. A llama eats hay instead of dog food. You know, the strength, um, if it's a bear, two dogs are going to deter the bear. Llama, maybe not. Maybe the llama's going to be dinner for the bear. 
you know, so it, it really does depend on the, the individual situation. And, you know, look at different breeds, look at different breeders, look at different dogs. You know, what's working, what's not working, what's most annoying, what's the best. And then you can help, you know, everybody's different. And if you go back to the question um, of how do you decide if this is right for you, you know, talk to the breeders. And then if, if it's a breeder that thinks everything's great and there's no problem with these dogs at all, go somewhere else. <laughs> you know, because you want to find somebody that's, you know, that's alert to the strengths and the weaknesses. Each breed is, more, is quite variable, so you're going to have a huge amount of overlap. You're going to find the right dog in every breed, but that breed average is going to vary. So some are more aggressive, some are less aggressive, some wander more, some bark more, you know, those sorts of things. And so if you, if you look at the averages, you might be able to actually figure out, you know, which one fits your situation best. If you've got 1,500 acres, different dog. If you've got two acres, different dog. You know, those, those are important issues. You want, you want the system to work. You want the people to be happy. You want the dog to be happy. You want the livestock to be safe. Make sure that you're able to handle this dog. It's a 10-year commitment. The large livestock guardian dogs, because they're large dogs, lifespans are anywhere from eight to 12 years. So they have a commitment of 10 years. And the thing that we always tell people is, if you had a bad experience for a year and a half and you decide to get rid of the dog, the dog's gonna have a bad experience for the rest of its life. Let's go back to that average Virginia farmer. I've got sheep, I've got cattle, calf, you know, calves out. All of a sudden I've got you know, predator problems. I wanna go out and invest in two maremmas. Uh, I know I'm gonna invest some time, but what kind of budget item uh, are we talking about? You're probably looking at about $2,500, $3,000. Each? No, total. Oh, for, the, for a pair? Yes. You know, we ran across one farmer who had lost 35 lambs in a short span of time. I'm thinking that's a wise investment. Oh, it is, because it's, it's not a one-year investment. You know, you're looking probably at an eight-year investment. So over the course of eight years, that's a small investment to pay for peace of yeah. mind and for protection of your herd. Well, yeah, when you take that number and, 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 like I said, multiply it out seven or eight years, you're exactly right. That's, that's a wise investment. And again, the dog is part of the farm, so there again, it's part of the business expense as well. So it's not that you're buying a dog, you're buying a poodle for the house. You know, you're buying actually a piece, they're a lot of, they're, yeah, they're, they're a piece of equipment for your farm. Ninety years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they worked so hard to establish. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. Anyone can be a Farm Bureau member, and there's a local Farm Bureau in every county. More information is at vafarmbureau.org. Virginia soybean farmers are hard at work growing soybeans to produce products you use every day. Candles, soaps, even crayons can be made from soybeans. Remember, when you buy soy, you're helping to support American jobs, the economy, and our nation's energy security.